Dear colleagues, we have the pleasure to welcome you. Eliana, we haven't started yet. I'm just starting the recording. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll hear you'll hear it you'll hear it count that um you'll hear it tell you that it, it's in it started so i'm just clicking start now okay. dear colleagues we have the pleasure to welcome you to the webinar organized by the editorial board of the IPA website. The theme we are going to develop today is related to the history of psychoanalysis and in particular to the Sigmund Freud archives, which are dedicated to preserve Freud's legacy, documents, manuscripts, letters, and as well as to encourage and facilitate research and writing about. As we all know, it was at the Nuremberg Congress in 1910 that the International Psychoanalytical Association was founded. Freud wanted to bring analysts from different geographical areas closer to one another in some kind of bond. He thought that the future of psychoanalysis could certainly and safely be entrusted to this link, provided and ensured by scientific exchanges. From this perspective, our IPA webinar program is in harmony with this hope and expectation. We know the context of the Nuremberg Congress and Freud's reasoning by documents, letters and articles saved and contained in archives, documents that develop psychoanalytical, epistemological, and cultural considerations. Because psychoanalysis does not only have its own history, it participates in the history of culture as the only psychic theory worthy of the name and the only therapeutic treatment capable of theorizing its own practice. Psychoanalysis takes part in the history of culture as a major event of the 20th century, providing a fundamental mode of exploring, understanding, and developing of our civilization. And today, we will examine how this legacy of Freud can be preserved in the web age. We have the pleasure and the honor to have with us today Louis Rose, Dr. Anton Chris, and Margaret McAleer, who will present and discuss with us these issues. Before presenting to our panelists, before presenting you our panelists, I would like to remind you the two-part process. In the first part, our guests will present their topic and exchange among them. On the second part, there's a discussion with you, the attendees, with you and the panelists. For doing so, you have to post your question at the right side of your screen in the panel control. There is a line entitled questions. You have to open the space, type your question and send it during the webinar session. Our panelists will try to answer as many questions as possible. And now, I will introduce you our first panelist, Louis Rose. Louis Rose is Professor of Modern European History at Otterbein University and Executive Director of the Sigmund Freud Archives. He heads his PhD in History at Princeton with a thesis titled The Psychoanalytic Movement in Vienna Toward a Science of Culture. His first book, The Freudian Calling, Early Viennese Psychoanalysis and the Pursuit of Cultural Science in 1999, received the Austrian Cultural Institute Prize for Best Book in Austrian Studies. It was followed by the, the Survival of Images, Art Historians, Psychoanalysts and the Ancients. And his most recent book is Psychology, Art, 
e antifascismo, Ernest Chris and Combridge and the politics of caricature. He is a member of the History of Psychoanalysis Committee of the International Psychoanalytical Association. From 2011 to 2018, he was editor of the interdisciplinary psychoanalytic journal American Imago, and he received in he received a memory membership in the American Psychoanalytic Association. Lou, please. Thank you very much. Um, let me first thank the IPA for this invitation. Let me extend my own welcome to everyone that is participating in the webinar. Um, I have been executive director of the Sigmund Freud Archives for the past now almost three years. And it's been in this time that we've moved into the web era, as the title of the seminar um, states. In other words, um, nearly half of the items, papers in the Sigmund Freud archives, uh, in the Freud papers at the Library of Congress, have uh, been put online. And we begin with that event this year. But I'd also like to say something about um, uh, my work as executive director, specifically how I come to it as a historian who has studied um, psychoanalysis from that perspective. Uh, the, the Sigmund Freud archives, and perhaps this deserves emphasis, is not a location. Uh, the Sigmund Freud archives is an organization, founded as an organization in 1951, uh, under the directorship of Kurt Eisler, uh, and with a board of Heinz Hartmann, Ernst Chris, uh, Hermann Nunberg, and Bertram Lewin. Uh, it, the board of the Sigmund Freud Archives uh, formed in order to assemble, locate, and set in motion the preservation of all documents, papers, um, related to the biography and career of Sigmund Freud. Um, the timing of the creation, 1951, tells you, of course, the, something about the context in which these individuals um, formed the Sigmund Freud archives. The context was, of course, um, post-1945 uh, and an effort to preserve the, um, uh, the connection, uh, the pathway back to the first generation, the first two generations of psychoanalysts uh, around Freud. The Library of Congress has been um, the repository of the Freud papers that the Sigmund Freud archives collected over the years, uh, also beginning in 1951. Uh, this, the board of the Freud archives uh, reached an agreement with the Library of Congress uh, to become the repository and the um, first donation, first donation to the Library of Congress made through the Sigmund Freud archives uh, followed in 1952. Now in the 50s and 60s, uh, Kurt Eisler um, took on a great deal of work, not only locating documents and contacting individuals who had correspondence, uh, but also uh, speaking himself with Freud family members, with colleagues, with patients, with uh, uh, other psychoanalysts uh, from Freud's Vienna uh, and from that era who knew Freud, and assembled uh, hundreds of interviews and recollections, which are also part of the Freud papers. Uh, we have the uh, tapes still of those interviews, uh, the transcripts of those interviews and recollections are part of the Freud papers themselves. Uh, so this speaks to the founding mission of the, of the archives. Um, across the years, uh, the archives has also committed itself to uh, making the widest possible access to, the, um, to these papers possible. Uh, this has gone through a number of, of stages but at the point we're at now, um, all but a handful of documents are now open to researchers. Uh, and as I began, more than half of them, or almost half of them, are now available online. 
and we can, you know, as the webinar proceeds, speak more uh, specifically about uh, about the contents of the of the papers themselves, specific contents. The um, perhaps the the second most important uh, moment in the history of the collection of those papers, I should say, occurred in the 1980s when Anna Freud, uh, the Anna Freud bequest, uh, also was included within the, the Freud papers in the um, uh, in the Library of Congress. I come to the executive directorship um, not as a psychoanalyst, but as a historian of psychoanalysis. And I think I'm the first executive director uh, to, to come to the position in that way. Uh, my interest in psychoanalysis goes back to, to my own graduate studies, uh, and it has continued uh, beyond then. My interest in psychoanalysis was both specifically uh, the, um, the beginnings of the movement in Vienna and the relationship between psychoanalysis as a movement and other cultural uh, po and political movements, and specifically its responses to other cultural and political movements. And I've, for I've followed that thread in, in my own work. Uh, but psychoanalytic theory and psychoanalytic method has also interested me as a historian in another way. Um, the, uh, the attention, obviously, that psychoanalysis gives to the past, uh, and not just the influence of the past, but the, the continuing, ongoing influence of the past, um, always interested me as a historian. Uh, I thought that Freud's um, uh, initial uh, insight spelled out in the Freud's initial insight um, into the to mental processes as overdetermined processes or processes with multiple determinations um, reflected you know very closely a, a historian's point of view. I think also, the, the psychoanalytic theory of the um, uh, coexistence of influence from the past, the ongoing influence of the past in a, um, uh, in a continuing process uh, interested me as a historian. And specifically Freud's uh, concern, his own historical concerns as he was developing psychoanalysis in the early uh, period. Specifically, his concern with the problem of war, with the origins and consequences of war. Uh, this, to me, uh, were crucial elements of Freud's own uh, conception of psychoanalysis, of its theory and method, uh, that interested me and still do as, as a historian. Um, I think all of those issues, um, the principle of overdetermination, the importance of recognizing uh, the continuing influence of the past and confronting that, as well as the problem of war, uh, Freud summarized in, in Civilization as Discontents. Uh, and that work has always um, remained a kind of a source of interest and inspiration. The, um, if I were to conclude um, what most um, join psychoanalysis and historical study together, it would be this. Uh, both are committed to returning or re-engaging the individual with the community or collective around him and her. Uh, this remains, I think, the, the essential um, aim, inspiration of psychoanalysis as a theory and method, and as uh, uh, as an essential inspiration and method of historians. Um, the, it is not to reduce one field to the other. It is not to reduce historical explanation to psychological explanation. It is not to subsume psychology within history, but to have people recognize um, the, um, uh, the, the, the specific spheres of each and the lines between them, and to be able to cross between them. Uh, this seems to be crucial. This seems also to be a, 
uh, the message of civilization as discontents, um, in which I think Freud was um, was warning or commenting upon the fact that any focus on psychology and any focus on history uh, must prevent or must beware of two dangers. One, the danger of withdrawal from the world, and the other, a danger of giving in to power worship at the same time. Uh, these two dangers, I think both psychoanalysis and uh, history confront each in their own spheres, um, and it connects the two to each other. So that serving as executive director of the Freud Archives um, and trying to preserve or help to preserve and expand access to Freud's papers uh, has been to me a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, for this so uh, brilliant and personal way to tell us how psychoanalysis uh, can be the field of interest for a historian too. Thank you very much. And now, let me introduce you Dr. Anton Kreese. Dr. Anton Kreese is professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School, psychiatrist for over 55 years, psychoanalyst for over 45 years, and a training and supervising analyst at the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute for over 35 years. He is the author of Free Association, Method and Process, and numerous other papers. Uh, Dr. Chris has received, he has served on the editorial boards of several of the major psychoanalytic journals, and he is currently the chair of, of the monitoring and advisory board of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis. He has also served on the board of trustees of the Anna Freud Center, the Anna Freud Foundation, and the Sigmund Freud Archives, of which he was executive director four years ago. He received many prizes and awards, as the Felix and Helen Deutsch Prize, the Heinz Hartmann Award. He received the 2015 Lifetime Achievement Award of the Massachusetts Psychiatric Society. He regards himself as more a teacher than an innovator. Tony, please, to you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm the old man in the panel. Uh, uh, I, I think I, my connection with the uh, uh, archives goes back about 40 years. Uh, and when I came into it, there was tension. Uh, everyone knew that Isla had done an incredible job. It's very hard to to appreciate how how much work he did. He was tireless, also in his psychoanalytic writings. But he did so many interviews with people who knew Freud, and was utterly devoted to it. But there was a problem. He had a view of the archives and of the papers that was based on uh, the fear that if the papers were opened up, they would be misused. And there's a good deal of uh, evidence that uh, Freud letters and papers have been misused. On the other hand, the uh, his community of historians, and particularly, uh, that includes uh, Lou's uh, great teacher, Karl Shorsky, and uh, uh, a couple of others who took a quite opposite position, which is you must open it up because everyone, uh, everyone has to be able to see the, the data for themselves. And even if some bad things happen, uh, better good things will happen. This became a serious problem within the archives. Uh, and the leader of the, the archives was uh, Professor Joe Goldstein of Yale, who was a lawyer, 
and psychoanalyst, co-author with Al Solnit and uh, Anna Freud, and ultimately that pressure from a majority of the board led to Eisler's separating himself in a very unfortunate and angry way. Uh, it was a, a sad uh, ending for his great contribution and the board was left nonetheless in charge and rapidly has uh, opened up almost everything. Uh, we turned to Harold Blum to be the executive secretary, later called executive director. And he did a great deal of work, including uh, a uh, traveling uh, uh, exhibition that was very popular and uh, enhanced the field. But he was not able to achieve his hope of putting the uh, Freud archive material online. And when, unfortunately, he fell ill, uh, it became my uh, task uh, to take up the uh, uh, job of executive director, uh, which I was not very eager to do, uh, but uh, did seem to be uh, necessary. Uh, and it was my good fortune to be able to get money from the Polanski Foundation, so that in fact, the money was there at last to uh, digitize the collection. Uh, that was only the beginning. It turned out that it's quite a job to prove that we had the rights to put it online. And the Library of Congress, of course, has great concern that they not be involved in something uh, that would, would be uh, uh, illegal or uh, against other people's rights. Well, we have that on, uh, on the online now. And Meg McAleer, who's the fabulous uh, coordinator of our archives, uh, will tell you about how to reach it and how to find it on the web. But I want to say a word or two more, if I may. Uh, of course, the best thing I did as director was to get Lou Rose to be director after me. And uh, I had brought him into the archives uh, earlier, and uh, it, it is a great fortune for the archives that he is uh, because he brings something much better than I could ever bring or that, because he's a historian. He knows the he has written about it. And uh, it has been a great pleasure for me to watch Lou writing his last book and uh, uh, being director. But it uh, raises the question, so why all this? Why are, why are we so eager to have all these letters, which Anna Freud started? Why do we want to have this? Well, there aren't so many people in history comparable to Sigmund Freud. He just was a giant. And that's the reason we want to know all about him. And the archives permits people to study him even more. Uh, I think that's all I really have to say. And uh, uh, maybe there'll be something more later. Okay. Uh, thank you, dear Tony, for this so uh, talented and so touching uh, way to, to explain to us uh, how the past, his history, but also history, uh, may be fundamental for our future. And now I will present you uh, Margaret McAleer. She has a PhD on history and he's an adjunct assistant professor of history at uh, Northern Virginia Community College. She is a senior archive specialist at the Library of Congress 
manuscript division since 1991 to present. She analyzes, evaluates, and makes recommendations for the permanent retention of manuscript collections documenting United States history. Margaret, please. Thank you. It is um, very much a pleasure to be with you today. What I thought I would do is give you a baseline perspective on the Sigmund Freud papers as they existed in the 1990s during the Freud Wars and as they exist now. And then I will take you briefly into the cloud where the collection took flight in 2017. Um, so what I'd like to do, and do we have the PowerPoint? Is that possible to show? I know, um, because I'm not, oh, good, thank you. Thank you, that's perfect, it's brilliant. Um, what I'd like to do is um, take you, invite you into, and Matthew, do I have controls? Okay, let me try. And sorry, I'm not able to, there, perfect. Thank you, brilliant. Um, I'd like to invite you into, uh, sorry, it's a little bit of delayed in the controls. Um, but I'd like to invite you into the Library of Congress. There, okay. Okay, um, into the Library of Congress, which is the oldest federal cultural heritage institution in the United States. We also claim to be the world's largest library, uh, which I think is also a claim made by the British Library. Uh, but we do have millions of books, recordings, photographs, newspapers, maps, and manuscripts in our collections. The uh, library is also an international research center that seeks to make available its rich and diverse collections to inform, inspire, engage, and support intellectual and creative endeavors. The manuscript division, uh, which is where I work, as Eliana said, and as a senior archive specialist, um, we hold nearly 12,000 uh, collections of personal papers and organizational records, largely but not exclusively focused on the history of the United States. One of the areas we collect more broadly is in the history of psychoanalysis. Central to our psychoanalytic holdings, of course, are the papers of Sigmund Freud himself. But we also hold more than 100 other related collections, including the papers of Anna Freud and many members of the Freud family, as well as um, persons within Freud's circle, as well as his critics. A list of these collections is available on our Sigmund Freud papers website, uh, which I'm showing here on the screen. The, um, the Sigmund Freud papers um, have a very long um, history, as, as you've just heard, and a very complicated past. As Lou mentioned, they came to the library in many different accessions beginning in 1952. They typically arrived in batches, sealed in envelopes, such as the one shown here. The collection was arranged and described by my colleague, Alan Tykro in the late 1970s and 1980s. By the time he finished his work in 1991, Allen had sorted, identified, arranged, and conserved more than 48,000 items. To give you a sense of how this translates physically, the collection is housed in 181 regular and oversized archival containers. If you were to stack them one on top of the other, the height would equal about two-fifths that of the Arc de Triomphe, assuming my math is right, which I do not guarantee. Um, I'd also like to briefly acknowledge the many Freud scholars and researchers who've helped to correct the identification of items over the years, for which we're very grateful. And I'm hoping that now that the collection is available online, we're going to get even more assistance from people this is an example of what we call crowdsourcing. When I arrived at the Library of Congress in the early 1990s and was asked to assist our regular reference staff in the manuscript reading room, 
I would count it a good day if I did not have to serve the Sigmund Freud papers. It was often not a good day because this was one of our most heavily used collections. The collection had many complications. One of the challenging features to the collection was its arrangement as multiple collections within one collection. And I don't know if anyone listening today had used the collection more than 20 years ago, but if you had, you would remember that it was organized into lettered series. Each series, in effect, was almost a separate collection. This was necessitated in large part by the terms of Anna Freud's contributions to the collection. Her 1970 gift that included the Freud Martha courtship letters, or Brockweave, among many other items, was restricted until the year 2000. Researchers did not have access to it, except with her permission or that of her designee, Kurt Eisler. Because of this restriction, the material had to be kept physically separate from the rest of the collection and was referred to as Series A. At her death in 1982, she bequeathed her father's remaining papers to the Sigmund Freud archives. Because the bequest came to the library as a deposit instead of a gift, in other words, the library did not own it, this material had to be kept separate from the rest of the collection as well. And it became known as Series E. The largest collection within the collection, Series B, consisted of material donated by the Sigmund Freud archives and others, as well as items purchased by the library. Everything in this series was open to researchers. It included um, many of Freud's correspondence to his family, his adolescent correspondence to Edward Silverstein, and his correspondence with many key players in the psychoanalytic movement. It also included notes, drafts, fair copies, and corrected galleys of his writings. Closed material given by the Sigmund Freud archives and other people were placed in series Z. Each item was assigned an opening date that ranged, as far as I can tell, from the 1980s to the year 2113. There was something of a New Year's ritual, which I became actually responsible for later, which was to open that year's batch of de-restricted material. In addition to these complications, the library decided in late 1995 to postpone a major exhibit that it had planned to exhibit in 1996. The decision was made because of insufficient funding for the exhibit, but it also was made several months after receiving a petition criticizing the exhibit for failing to acknowledge the range of scholarly debate on the origins of psychoanalysis. The Freud exhibit was one of several exhibits in the Washington area that inspired controversy in the early 1990s. The exhibit eventually opened in 1998. It is still available on our website for anyone who's interested. There's a link to it from the Freud Papers homepage. The Freud collection was indeed complicated, but much changed with the collection in the year 2000. The restrictions on Honor Freud's 1970 gift ended that same year, the Sigmund Freud archives converted the 1980s bequest to a gift. The collections within a collection could now be merged into one. Um, this slide, next slide, um, shows you the current arrangement and content of the collection, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail later. But um, I'd like to point out um, one other thing. Um, very little of the collection is currently closed. Um, this list shows you what is currently closed. Among these items, there are only about 25 letters that remain closed. And for each of those letters, there is a photocopy that is complete um, apart from the name of a patient redact that's redacted. And I'm trying to advance the slide there. Uh, this shows you one of the letters um, with the name of a patient redacted. Um, I was asked in 2000 to implement all these changes, and it was immensely satisfying. For me, it revealed the Freud papers as a major feat of collecting rather than a set of administrative problems. There have been so many factors working against the survival of Freud's papers, 
not the least of which was Freud's own ambivalence toward their survival. The collection, often built piece by piece, provides a body of evidence into the workings of the mind of a historically pivotal individual and the complexity of his relationships that is, frankly, unlikely to be paralleled in more modern collections. One of the things I'm acutely attuned to as an archivist is whether a narrative voice emerges from a collection. This happens only when a collection is sufficiently large and rich enough in content to allow us to read a person's voice as it changed over time and in a variety of contexts. Such collections permit us to delve into the layers of human complexity and nuance. Added to the insights of Freud's own papers are hundreds of interviews conducted by Kurt Eisler. Many of these interviews were recorded in the early 1950s, a little more than a dozen years after Freud's death. What I find so fascinating in the interviews is the fact that he conducted them as he was building the collection. And many of the interviews start with the solicitation of letters. The most recent phase of the collection's history, trying to advance the slide, um, occurred in 2017 when portions of the collection comprising the papers of Sigmund Freud and his family were digitized and made available online on the Library of Congress website. The Sigmund Freud archives, as Tony mentioned, had long expressed an interest in making the collection available online. And in the summer of 2015, the library received a generous grant from the Polonsky Foundation to digitize the collection. The compelling incentive was what Princess Marie Bonaparte pointed out to Freud in 1937. Freud belongs to the history of human thought. The online collection went live in February 2017. While in the past, dozens of Freud scholars traveled annually to Washington to use the collection in our reading room, scholars from around the world can now access the collection remotely. And I'm sorry, this is a little slow. Um, trying to advance the slide to the next. Um, the um, collection can be found on the Library of Congress website. There's, I have the URL in the first bullet. There's also a link to the collection from the Sigmund Freud Archives website, or you can just simply Google Freud Papers Library of Congress. And Matthew, perhaps you would advance the slides for me to the next. The, the digital edition comprises the contents of more than 2,000 folders. Digitized in their entirety are those series containing the papers that Freud or members of his family would either have created or owned. And I thought I would just walk you through a little bit of the content. We have the Freud family papers, um, which is divided into three parts. The first part consists of Freud's letters to members of his family, including his mother, his wife, Martha, including the courtship letters, his children, including Anna, his siblings, his grandchildren, nieces, nephews, as well as his Bernays in-laws. The second set contains correspondence not including Sigmund Freud. This is between members of the family or between the family and people outside the family. The subject file contains largely material other than letters that document the lives of the Freud family. The general correspondence series contains Freud's correspondence with nearly 600 persons outside the family. At times, this correspondence consists of a single letter. At other times, it is extensive, revealing Freud to be a prolific correspondent. The subject file contains a variety of records, including school records, calendars, notes, notebooks, birth citizenship, marriage certificates, patient records, biographical data, birthday greetings, condolence letters, financial and estate records and printed matter. Freud's writings are not located actually where you see them listed. They're located in the oversized series at the bottom. As you know, Freud preferred to write on very large sheets of paper. And because of their size, he needed to house them separately in very large boxes. Uh, we also photographed um, two artifacts as well as a painting 
And of course, also available are the hundreds of Eisler interviews. We did not digitize a very large supplemental file, which consists largely of posthumous material written after Freud's death. Um, the next slide uh, that shows um, ways in which the collection can be searched online. Um, Advance, yeah, thank you. Um, we can go up, yeah, thanks, is perfect. Um, this shows you the Sigmund Freud Papers homepage. Um, it can be searched from this page um, or it can be searched from the finding aid. And there's a link to the finding aid below. Um, from the home page, there is a search text box at the top. I have entered the term young. And then to the right, you see the many hits on the um, on the, the search for young material. My favorite way on the next slide is to search the collection from the finding aid. The finding aid page also has a search box at the top where you can enter a term and search the collection. Or if you choose, you can browse the contents of the collection by scrolling down the list of folders. Underneath each folder is a link to the digital content. You can also download images in a variety of formats and resolutions. Um, right below the image to the lower left side, there's a box where you can choose a format, um, including a high resolution TIFF. I think this will be particularly popular with um, documentary filmmakers as well as exhibit curators. The next slide um, shows, I'm very, very pleased that uh, this summer we are going to be streaming the Sigmund Freud home movies. Um, there are 11 home movies um, that will be available for streaming, which I'm, I'm very excited about. Many of the films were taken by Mark Brunswick or Princess Marie Bonaparte, um, largely in the last 10 years of Sigmund Freud's life. We also, which I think is going to be of particular interest to this group, have a film by Sandor Laurent documenting the 11th Congress of the International Psychoanalytic Association that was held in Oxford, England in 1929. And I'm not sure how many of you have seen the film. Um, it is, it's absolutely terrific. It shows the attendees at the Congress milling about before the Congress. Laurent introduces each person as his camera settles on them. Dozens of prominent early psychoanalysts are introduced. And if you're at all nostalgic about this era, as I am, it, it's really a marvelous film to watch. We also, at the library, have a thousand photographs documenting Freud's life and that of his family. Many of these photographs are available also on the library's website. And I can share with you later if you're interested in how to locate them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Margaret, for this so lively presentation of the Library of Congress and for uh, explaining us how uh, history and psychoanalysis uh, can be interesting and interested, related, uh, associated for the research. Uh, we have two or three minutes, not more. Uh, if you have some questions to discuss among you uh, before passing to the uh, question answer session with the attendees. I would just reiterate, um, I think what has come through from uh, both Tony and uh, Meg's presentations, which is the very important significance for psychoanalysis in the present, um, that there be awareness um, of the foundations on which it has developed. Um, and that uh, particularly, uh, I think particularly in our day and age, um, keeping an awareness of what not just psychoanalytic foundations were in Freud's work, but what was radical in Freud's work uh, and remains so, uh, needs to be kept at the forefront. and. These archives are committed to, to keeping that, that foundation uh, before people's eyes. And um, that people across uh, all regions of the IPA 
uh, will be able to access it online, I think is um, a, a tremendous opportunity. Thank you, Lou. Tony, something to add, no? No, uh, I'm very impressed with, with my colleagues' uh, presentations. Okay. Okay, no, so we can uh, come up with the um, discussion session, the second part. Um, for the moment, I can uh, group uh, two uh, kind of questions. I will group the first type. Huh? It's, uh, the first one is addressed to, to Louis uh, Rosa. Is there a direct link to access those Freudian documents? Is that free? Is there an index of content? And another question that is also for uh, uh, Lou and Meg, what papers are not yet available online? What are the criteria for the selection? What are the criteria for the selection? And then is another question I will continue later. So I give you the... All right, the, um, what is online is, yes, universally accessible and free to, to access. Um, if the question also is uh, reproducing that material in other venues, then each individual researcher needs to um, explore what permissions uh, are required. But the Sigmund Freud Archives is also um, ready to help people um, find out what permissions would be necessary. Uh, and we're now, in fact, putting together a, um, a new website uh, for the Freud archives uh, that will provide you know updated information on that. As far as uh, if I understand correctly the question regarding closed material, uh, there is nothing that the Sigmund Freud archives has closed right now. Um, on the page that um, that Meg showed that showed what letters and interviews still were closed, um, those are closed and there's just literally a handful of them. Those are closed because of the conditions of the donation or because the executor of the estate um, has kept them closed. Uh, but the Marie Bonaparte letters are going to be open in less than two years. January 2020, I believe, is the date they will be opened. And uh, when the executors of the uh, other material um, agree to open them, they can be opened um, as well. And the Sigmund Freud Archives continues to work with the, um, the executors to make that possible. Uh, but the Sigmund Freud Archives um, has closed nothing to researchers. Where there are redactions, uh, for example, uh, those are the redactions of patients' names uh, for ish, um, because of question, ish, questions of confidentiality. Uh, and that too um, goes back to conditions of donation or acquisition of the of the material as well. Uh, so I, I think that uh, any researcher into the Freud papers now, uh, whether online or at the manuscript division, the Library of Congress, is is going to have access um, to everything that the Sigmund Freud Archives has been able to collect and has deposited at the Library of Congress. Um, I, I would just like to add, um, I think one of the questions was about the criteria for selection in terms of what was digitized. As you can imagine, digitizing a collection is very, very expensive. And what we decided to do was to focus on anything that Sigmund Freud produced himself or might have owned, as well as his family. What we did not digitize was a very large part of the collection, which is, I don't know, maybe about almost half of the collection, which consists of material written about Freud after Freud's death. A lot of this material is still under copyright and is not in the public domain. And therefore, we decided not to digitize it. But we did digitize anything that Sigmund Freud would have written or owned or anything written or owned by his family. However, um, we made um, a huge effort to clear copyright to, to be able to put this material online. 
we were not able to get permission in several instances. And so you will see under um, in several folders, it says that it's not yet available. And that's because we have not yet been able to clear copyright for that material to put it on available online. And I'll just can I add very briefly that, um, and I wanted to, to make this point also um, uh, from the beginning as well, there are uh, archives and collections um, around the world that people can also now link to online um, in London, in Vienna, um, in other locations. Um, we provide, you know, have added those links for people at the Sigmund Freud Archives website. Um, and, and I think that, um, again, in, in this day and age, in the, in the web age, um, being able to link to the Freud papers at the Library of Congress will also open up links to, to other documents as well. May I just say briefly also, I think one of the largest caches of outstanding Freud correspondence that people have not been able to see are Freud's letters to Princess Marie Bonaparte. And as Lou mentioned, they are due to open in the year 2020. And we hope to be able to digitize these and make them available as well. And And there is another question that is uh, close to what uh, Lou was saying. What should be the role of a society's library in disseminating the psychoanalysis through in the community? Uh, I, I think that has to happen along a number of different um, avenues. I don't, I don't think there's one way. I think the, for example, um, the IPAs, History of Psychoanalysis Committee is working on that through, you know, in, in its way um, by bringing into contact the um, people from throughout the IPA's regions that are working um, uh, in archives in the museums or directing these archives and museums. Um, the work that historians do, um, the work that historians do in the archives. I have to say to me is still, you know, the, the heart of the matter. Um, what we want to do is, is open up uh, as much material to people uh, as we can. And by open up, I mean uh, make it as widely accessible as possible. Uh, the, um, then it becomes the, the work of the researcher, it becomes the work of the archivist, it becomes the work of the museum director. Um, within you know, his or her field uh, to bring this to the attention of the wider community. Uh, it's, we're, we're in an age where, quite honestly, that you know, is becoming more and more difficult. And that, to me, is what emphasizes the importance of, of what we've been doing, of, of what not only the Library of Congress has been doing with the collection, um, uh, but is also what is, happening, what is happening elsewhere as well. <clears throat> Could I add, uh, the choice of the Library of Congress as the repository for these papers was made at a time when the world seemed still quite unstable after World War II. And <clears throat> the Library of Congress seemed the safest place in the world. And so far, it has continued. Uh, to be a reliable and safe place with highly trained uh, personnel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another brief question. Uh, when, uh, during digitalized archives, were there any problem of translation? We actually... Problem. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I didn't get the last word. Problem of translation? Yes, during the... the, um, uh, um, the uh, digitalization. Um, if, if, if I, I could... Adam, but maybe, Meg, you go ahead. 
yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think I can um, I can answer that. We took um, visual images of all of the documents, and we did not transcribe them. Um, so what people are seeing are the actual images of the documents themselves. Included in the collection sometimes are transcriptions or translations of some of the documents. But those we received with the collection and we, those have been digitized as well. So I just want to cl clarify something about searching the collection. When you search the collection, you in effect are searching the guide to the collection or the finding aid. So when you search Carl Jung, for instance, you will get um, a selection of folders in which his name appears in the folder title. You are not able to search the contents of the documents themselves. However, we hope to change this, at least in terms of the Kurt Eisler interviews. What we hope is to be able to render the Eisler interviews in such a way that you will be able to search any term within those interviews, since many of the interviews are typed. And if this happens, I think it's going to open up a wonderful avenue for research where you will be able to analyze memories of Freud in ways that you can't just by reading through the interviews themselves and might possibly maybe expose some reactions to Freud that the interviewee wasn't even aware that they had. And so I think that kind of in-depth data analysis is going to be wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Okay. Um, just picking up on the Eisler interviews, I, I think the Eisler interviews may be one of the more underused um, sources within the Freud papers. Uh, what I mean by that is for, you know, for many years, um, the estate of Kurt Eisler had limits on, on which interviews could be read and, and uh, what would become open. As I say, with the exception of five, they are now entirely open. Um, but it's important that different researchers, many researchers go into these interviews because Kurt Eisler collected a, a great deal of important material, but as an interviewer, he also had his own interests. Um, he was looking in, he wanted chiefly information about Freud as a clinician, um, how Freud did his, went about his work. And Eisler could elicit a great deal of interesting information on this question, but he didn't direct questions in other directions. And that's why it's important for more than one set of eyes to see these interviews and search through them for clues as to what more we can learn about Freud's method and theory. Uh, so it does also have something to do with how we get this information out further. It takes a collective effort. Um, and, and I think these interviews and recollections need to be used more extensively. We also want to digitize the audio of these interviews as soon as possible, uh, for which funding is required and we're, we're working on that. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Lou. Uh, two more questions related. Um, for example, beyond the text, what could we consider a Freud legacy to web aids? And I would like to introduce the second question right away. A quite necessary way to avoid the rising of fascism in the world, we need to reconsider Freud's position about war and several other issues related to humankind. A quite interesting work of you four. Congratulations. So the two questions, please. About the war. Okay. Uh, what was the first? I'll, I'll, the first question again was, could, could I hear it again? Yes. Just a moment. Uh, beyond the text, what could we consider a Freud's legacy to web aids? Well, the legacy to the web age, it's interesting that I've emphasized up till now the importance of the web for getting all this information out. But I think it is also important that people be able to um, 
uh, to, to explore uh, in whatever detail they can. Um, Freud's way of thinking, um, his methodological questions, because I think the emphasis uh, was always on how um, people can, as I said before, can take what they learn about themselves, for example, or take what they learn about the mind and bring it into the world around them. Uh, that, that goal hasn't changed. Um, and in some ways, you know, the web, I think of social media and the use and abuse of it, um, has made that more difficult. Uh, and psycho, the work of the psychoanalyst and the work of the historian can, um, can preserve that, can preserve that legacy. And so I think that this record is extremely important. Uh, to go back to, to what in Freud's writings or what in Freud's thinking I think is important uh, in our own time, uh, I would just maybe expand on what I had mentioned briefly at the beginning. If you look through civilization as discontents, I think Freud, as other liberal intellectuals at the time, I think of Max Weber as another example, uh, were very concerned, very concerned that in the post-war generation, uh, there would a, a, a sense of withdrawal would take place, um, a, a withdrawal from um, social and collective concerns. And that wasn't the point. The point of, of Freud's uh, of psychoanalysis was to, to prevent that. Uh, I think that's why he begins civilizationist discontents with the um, taking up the argument of Romain Rolland who was himself very much socially and politically active, uh, someone very much whom Freud admired, but whose theory in the late 20s, he thought, might have the result of leading many people to withdraw from the world around them. And Freud wanted not only to, wanted to, to address that issue. And of course, the other question that Freud was on Freud's mind was that, you know, the, the alternative withdrawal in many of a younger generation might be you know, succumbing to power worship. And that too, his writing in Civilization as Discontents was concerned about. It's interesting to note the same, after a year after he, the revised Civilization as Discontent was, was published, um, there's a document in the Freud archives, uh, Freud signed a anti-war petition that had been sent to him by a German progressive physician, circulated among physicians, um, that, that reflect, reflected his own view in this regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Lou, there is another question that it can be uh, related to, to your um, answer. Uh, how politics and culture and psychoanalysis are related in our days? Do you want me to take that one first or Tony, did you want to, to step in? Um. No, I was uh, I was still on the last question, so I uh, maybe I, I want to emphasize Freud was a great ironist. He he uh, he loathed uh, fascism, but uh, when he entered his wonderful new house in London after living for uh, something like fifty years and a rather dark second floor apartment in Vienna, he walked into the garden and said, Heil Hitler. Uh, it, he, he was constantly aware of politics and those forces. Some, some analysts are today also, sometimes I personally think a little too exuberant in uh, diagnosing people, but uh, uh, that is people who are not their patients, but uh, the, the, that, that is now a matter of debate. <clears throat> yeah, I would, I would follow up on that too and emphasize that I think what's important to keep in mind, you know, in our own time uh, is certainly obviously what we confront in the U.S. and in Europe as the rise of a, a new right wing movement of different um, tendencies. Um, that has to be acknowledged. But I think also when, when Freud was confronting that in his time, I think he also emphasized very strongly, again, that the use of psychology and politics 
must be clearly distinguished that there is no psychological, for example, um, quick fix to a political problem. The importance of psychology is to encourage people to enter the political space, the political realm. And, and what we, and today that in itself is what's crucial. Um, you know, using psychology to, um, as Tony said, to diagnose uh, political figures, I don't even think Freud advocated that very much, although many of his followers did. Um, leading up to the, you know, during the Second World War, um, psychoanalysts engaged in war work, anti-fascist war work, um, as political analysts, as uh, students of propaganda, for example. Um, and, and there are so many, very many good studies now beginning on the extent to which their background in psychology and psychoanalysis influenced their approach and the extent to which they simply were um, pursuing, so to speak, a different line of work. Um, and, uh, and, and I would just urge people to keep that in mind, that the relationship between psychology and politics doesn't mean conflating the two. Um, I, I would argue against that. So the question, the next question, um, you are talking about the limitation of history and psychoanalysis and the limitation of individual and collective. Could you please develop more? I guess that's for me too. I, um, we, we live in a time um, when I think that um, a new generation, a new generation needs to take political questions seriously, uh, needs to take the concerns that touch on the collective um, seriously and from new perspectives. Um, if psychology has a role to play in that, it has a the role to give people, to help people gain the sense of freedom, the sense of responsibility to do that. Uh, we don't want to see the, um, um, the traditional foundations of political participation and responsibility um, whittled away to nothing. Um, and we don't want to have um, psychology um, substitute in people's minds for maintaining that foundation and um, setting out on, on new directions. I don't, I don't know that that answers the question as would it ask, but that's um, from a, this is, this is what I would say might be the limits of the web age. <laughs> I can't, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having to guess at what the, uh, at the intent behind the question. Thank you. Uh, there's another question related, so uh, I will ask uh, Tony to, to answer. How could there be more? How could be? How could there be more room for the history of psychoanalysis in analytic training? Uh, also, that the material. Um, no, the question about tra analytic training. Um, well, I obviously won't be able to answer it fully, but there is one thing that. Uh, confronts us all the time. Our candidates read papers written in an, a different era. And some of the things that they can read from the past, and particularly Freud's, well, Freud's investigative writings are fabulously important today. And the candidates want to learn more and more about that. But the issues of technique and the attitude towards patients has changed vastly. Freud's view of his position in the analytic setting was that he could be neutral. <clears throat> Modern analysts, by and large, don't believe that at all. They believe that they are participants. And this... Uh, uh, it's a very important to change, but when our candidates read the technique papers, 
of the 40s and 50s, <clears throat> they, they sometimes get a very false impression of what has happened in psychoanalysis. So history counts. You have to know uh, when you are reading something from the past and not everything from the past simply can be taken in. I don't know if that's enough. We will, we will, con we will continue on this line. Uh, maybe it's uh, a question of uh, philosophy of history, so uh, Meg and uh, Luis can uh, answer. Are we at a time when we can learn from studying the history of the psychoanalytic movement, or it is still too early? Meg, do you want to... Um, no, actually, Luke, you go ahead. I, um, it, it's, it's not too early. It's not too early at all um, to um, to to explore the history of the psychoanalytic movement. Um, my concern is that it not be an internal history, so to speak, that that the psychoanalytic movement be understood within various contexts and in light of the various different activities that psychoanalysts were engaged in. Um, to become a psychoanalyst um, didn't mean narrowing one's range of interests and activities down to a, a single point. Um, for many analysts, it meant expanding what already were a series of interests and activities in a new direction. Um, this is what began to interest me in my, my own research. Um, why, for example, I was interested in how early Vini psychoanalysts eventually became interested in the circle around Abby Warburg. Um, and then how, for example, someone from outside of psychoanalysis, uh, Ernst Gombrich, uh, could work, could collaborate with Ernst Chris so closely, and then how both moved away from their psychological interests into war work and, and political activity. It's that kind of, of process um, that interests me. And yes, studying the psychoanalytic movement now can certainly um, uh, be helpful. I mean, we're talking about a movement that um, whose members were confronting um, enormous, um, enormous pressures, uh, not to say dangers, and they confronted them in in several different ways. Um, so I wouldn't say that the psychoanalytic movement is one, and I don't think I'm saying anything that the people who are listening, you know, don't know, um, but. But when you do the history of the psychoanalytic movement, it cannot be an internal one. It has to be one that explores it within different contexts. What Freud might have called, you know, the overdetermined contexts in which the past exists. Yeah. Uh, may I add, it's never too early, but one must remember that views will change and that a view today is not necessarily the same as the view in 10 years. And there's no requirement that today's views be absolute. There is no such thing. So just as we learned from working with patients, history is a live uh, developing investigation and uh, should start at any time. And now is a good time. And the archives do offer assistance with the study of psychoanalysis historically. If you want to think about studying the past, I would you know, think about how Freud described uh, in Civilization as Discontents again, um, a model of the mind in, in layers, you know, layers of the past. And then, and, and many times, you know, he used that, that kind of image that in exploring the mind, we're exploring layers of, of memories, layers of experience as, they, as the mind has preserved them. But then it was Freud himself who said, but this is only a, a kind of uh, conceit, for example, to use that kind of metaphor, because in fact, the mind isn't layered, right? If you wanted to, if you wanted to have an image as Freud said of, of the mind at work, you'd have to imagine, for example, he said that Rome today um, would exist with all of the buildings from the past and the present 
in the same place. Um, and, and I think that image is really the challenge to psychoanalysis and to historians. So yes, you can, you can go into any um, uh, uh, movement from the past. And if you see it in the way Freud described it, for example, in that image, yes, um, the time is fine to, to explore it. Margaret? Um, I am obviously psychoanalysis is not my not my field. Uh, my own field of research as an historian is on immigration at the end of the 18th century and notions of citizenship and rights. And um, I very much feel that um, exploring the past is a way to understand the present more deeply perhaps as a case study of processes, um, what, what Lou had, had mentioned. So for me, um, exploring the impact of the French Revolution on notes, notions of, um, of human rights versus the rights of citizenship is very analogous to the way we have viewed citizenship post 9-11. And so it's, it's, I know my own research has helped me understand more deeply the, the present and some of the challenges that we go through. Which is off the topic, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not psychoanalysis. But. May, I, may I add, the archives are not intended to make Freud the last word in psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is a live field. It has developed very greatly uh, in the rather long time now since uh, Freud died. Uh, but knowing about him and his way of thinking and what he contributed can still have further study. And the archives is there for that, but not, not for the idea that it, it will uh, enshrine Freud. That's not, I think, its aim. Maybe for a brief time, Isla thought so. Maybe Anna Freud felt that a little bit, but I don't think much. I can assure you my father did not. I'm looking for a question. I'm looking for a question. Um... who was asking if you could give us uh, I'm sorry, I have to find it. Mm. Okay. Uh, would you like to share with us something new and surprising you might have recently learned from the archives? Um, well, I, I mentioned it briefly earlier. Um, the uh, petition that Freud signed in 1932 um, was not simply an anti-war petition, but it was it was organized, you know, as uh, from a progressive uh, political point of view, to use that term. I don't know that that would be the that wouldn't be the term that would be used at the time. Um, it certainly reflected, for example, a, um, a, a liberal left perspective. But what was interesting about this petition was in 1932, it emphasized that it was, first of all, the conditions of the depression, the economic conditions of the depression that were creating conditions for a war. And specifically, the most dangerous possibility for war would be war directed at the Soviet Union. Um, and and that there needed to be there needed to be an acknowledgement in order to prevent war of the seriousness of economic conditions and also a uh, an understanding of what was happening in the Soviet Union and this was um, this was a petition Freud signed very readily um, this is a document in in the in the archives uh, I it's it turned out to be very prescient obviously. Um, in in predicting what would um, you know the you know key 
generators of the Second World War. Uh, so 1932, Freud's already, you know, I, th I think recognizes um, what's going on in the world around him. Um, his own approach, however, as I say, was was expressed in in writings that didn't address specific political issues of his day, uh, but more the larger question of, I guess you could say, psychological consciousness and political consciousness. I, I might uh, add uh, a much more specific uh, matter, the uh, Eisler's interview with my father. Uh, uh, he, my father begins by saying, there's one thing that will interest you. Now, that seemed to me totally absurd because my father was in touch with Freud every week for many years. And uh, yeah, there would be tons of things that Eisler would want to know, but my father wasn't, wasn't going to give him that. So he says, there's one thing that will interest you. And that was the change of editorship of the journals and at that time uh he offered my father the editorship of the imago since my father was not only a psychoanalyst but also a, a, an art historian and lou became uh, editor of that journal some years later but uh my father then said well under some conditions I think the German word was Bedingungen. And he, as he told it, Freud was completely surprised. What, what would this pipsqueak in his early 30s be? Imagine that he could give conditions to Freud, who was uh, almost 80. And, uh, but Freud listened. And uh, my father was saying, you know, we can't have one psychoanalysis in this journal and another psychoanalysis in another. And so you ought to make Hartman the editor of the International. Oh, says Freud, would he accept it? Would he accept it? Well, it was, it's a great pleasure to read such an interview and learn about what was going on as the young were trying to influence the old man. And I had one other story, which doesn't come from the archives, but might be amusing. They, they all, this young group, objected to Freud saying that he postulated uh, the death drive on uh, biological terms, on biological basis. And Freud said, OK, you are right. And he crossed it out and changed it on psychological basis. And at that point, they gave up. You couldn't argue with Freud about psychology. Well, I, I, there are lots of things to be learned in the materials of the archives. And as Ma Meg said before, uh, in the uh, Isla interviews, there's a, a great deal that, that will be of interest. Um, my interest is also in the history of the collection itself. Um, I've been an archivist for more than a quarter century, and this collection is very unique. It is really a, um, the result of a complex web of relationships between um, Kurt Eisler and Anna Freud and hundreds and hundreds of, of donors. And it, it's a really fascinating thing in and of itself. I have become recently very interested in the Eisler interviews for what they reveal about how he built the collection. And um, so this is an avenue that I think is, um, is particularly fascinating. May I add to it uh, that <clears throat> some 30 years after Eisler left the archives, uh, the board named him principal founding director uh, in recognition of his enormous achievement and uh, animosities are now long past. <laughs>
a last question maybe. To what extent do you think the culture of social media, which emphasizes directing one's attention to the outside and the simplification of thinking, conspires against a psychoanalytic culture? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let the psychoanalyst answer that one first. It's probably so, uh, uh, but there do seem still to be people who want to look inward. Uh, but it's probably, uh, I mean, the, the person puts it as a question, but it's, it seems to be a statement more. Yes. Uh, and I think most people would agree that there, there is a, a certain tendency in the, the world at large to look for quick answers and uh, uh, easy satisfaction. But it is also uh, uh, true that uh, some people want to dig into themselves and learn more. Uh, I, I do not believe psychoanalysis uh, is going out of business, but some of the old arrogance may be gone, and that's good. I would, I, I would just simply add um, that what, again, to uh to sort of keep with the line of thought i began at the beginning um i think what concerned freud by the late 1920s early 1930s was a a destructive nihilism uh that could overtake society um now his interpretations of it and his responses to it are matters of research and and discussion um, but in our, I would, I would say that we have something to learn from Freud's perspective in that sense for the kinds of, of issue raised by the, this question and others. Um, we are confronting, I think, a kind of nihilism, a kind of destructive nihilism that um, we haven't dealt with before. Um, not with, it, nothing is unprecedented, but neither does the present just simply recapitulate the past either. And social media, um, to the extent to which social media advances that kind of, of destructive nihilism, no, it is not advancing the interests of psychoanalysis. The extent to which um, we can um, um, utilize social media, transform it, um, so as to um, combat that kind of nihilism, then it, it doesn't. It doesn't doesn't work against us, so to speak. But but I think looking for the signs of that kind of nihilism and many different phenomena are what's crucial. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so history, psychoanalysis, uh, library. Uh, the three of them related to the past. Uh, here today, you are giving us a very very interesting. Uh, uh, outline of uh, the way they are articulated and what I can say is that we are very grateful to you, very grateful to the history, to psychoanalysis and to the library. Uh, thank you very much uh, Lou, uh, Tony and Meg. Uh, thank you all of you for your attention and for your questions. I would like also at the, la at the end to propose you the next webinar. It will be at the 26th of August with Zanin Puget. And save the day. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Au revoir.